So that wasn't my natural, uh, my natural um, topic, but uh, let me explain how I arrived to this point. So the initial motivation was about stationary Lagrangians, which are special Lagrangians in uh, Keller, Keller manifolds. There are some type of an some analogs of minimal surfaces. And uh, then I wanted to study various notions of modified mean curvature flow for these uh, Lagrangians. And the project was to explore these flows uh, doing some numerical experiments with a computer. So that was a joint work with uh, Francois Joberto from Nantes. But uh, it didn't go very far because we immediately stumbled on an essential problem that I didn't know about at the time. So the problem was the following. You want to run a flow on a computer for certain Lagrangian submanifolds, say in R4. So naturally in a computer, these manifolds are polyhedral, polyhedral surfaces. So they are made of small triangles. And each of these triangles is, uh, is in a Lagrangian plane. But then the problem is that we didn't have any examples. So we had no non-trivial examples, almost none of uh, poly polyhedral Lagrangians in R4. So there it stops. And we, why, why do we have, we don't have anything? Because there is no, for example, there is no deformation theory, like in the smooth case where we have a Lagrangian neighborhood theorem. This doesn't work for piecewise linear. Uh, because there are no, the flow techniques do, doesn't apply in a straightforward manner to piecewise linear geometry. So the, the vector field are, could, be, could have a strange flow. And essentially, I realized that uh, symplectic uh, piecewise linear geometry is a terra incognita. We don't know anything or almost anything. For example, uh, the classical uh, first results in a course on symplectic geometry, like Darbu local coordinates, the stability of the symplectic uh, forms, etc. Nothing holds for in the piecewise linear context. It's uh, these are open questions. Uh, and then, then it started. So that was our first result. So. Let me make a remark. My former student, uh, Bernard Grazer, yeah. <clears throat> that you can presume, that you can approximate in C zero a symplectic map uh, compactly supported as a topic of the identity by piecewise linear. Right. I know this local result. I had a very hard time to find his PhD somewhere, uh, right. but I found it eventually. Yeah. Uh, so he had a clever approximation results for uh, symplectomorphism. Uh, locally of R4, and uh, that was about the only result. And there is also something else, a student of uh, Melanie Bertelson, Julie Distecke, was some result in piecewise linear geometry and triangulations. Um, but that's it. So our contribution is this one. Uh, so it's, it was a joint work with uh, Samuel Tapi and Francois Joberto. And there is an add-on to get to the C1, the C1 estimate. So do you see the, the arrow when I'm waving it on the screen or it, it doesn't appear? Yes, we see it. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Thanks. So this is about a smoothly, uh, so you can, we can talk about Lagrangian tori in R4 to make it simpler. So we are looking for Lagrangian tori in C2, immersed, smoothly immersed Lagrangian tori of C2, and uh, they may be approximated in the C0 sense by immersed isopo isotropic polyhedral tori. So these tori, as I said before, they are made of uh, Euclidean triangles, and each of these triangles is contained in a Lagrangian plane of uh, C2, okay? Uh, so this is really reminiscent of the edge principle in fact, in fact, the statement uses the edge principle in the smooth case. Um, the main thing we prove is the second sentence. If the smooth torus is isotropic in general or Lagrangian, the approximation can be done in the C1 sense. 
in the sense that these tri triangle are really close to tangent, tangent spaces of the smooth tori torus. Okay. So with this, you can you can get lots and lots of examples. I mean, as many examples, uh, all of these are modeled on uh, the smooth ones, so almost as many as the smooth, smooth ones. And uh, uh, let me mention, make some remarks about the proof. I won't give the proof. I give just a sketch of proof and ideas. Uh, excuse me, your definition of uh, immersed isotropic polyhedral torus, so isotropic polyhedral just conditions on the faces of higher dimension. Yes, yes, exactly. So no, no conditions in the world. No, there is no condition in this. Mm -hmm. Okay, the proof is based um, in fact, there is a condition on, on the boundary. This is just by integration by the Stokes theorem. The, the integral of the Liouville form on the, the boundary of each face has to be zero. And uh, so the proof is based, this proof, our proof is based on the fixed point principle, which is a sort of a surprise, maybe surprising uh, or strange, I don't know. And uh, well, this is not really a mathematical statement, but the proof was more complicated than expected. Well, you're going to tell me it's always the case, but it's much more complicated that, than expected because it was a quite hard problem because the first paper is about is more than a hundred page. And then the add-on uh, recent preprint is uh, uh, 25 pages more to get the, to the C1 control. So it's quite difficult to prove this. And the proof involves a, a certain moment map geometry, which I'm going to discuss after. And when I'm, I'm talking about fixed point principle, it's we are looking for zeros of this moment map, okay? And there was a spin-off. So why do we do this? Um, because it, maybe it's, it's um, complicated because you, we use this point of view, but there were some outcomes um, that can be, you can get from this point of view. So some techniques, uh, which have to do with effective constructions and experimental math, math. Basically, we get a flow for surfaces in R4, and the flow converges toward Lagrangian polyhedral surfaces. Let me show you this flow on the computer program now. So I have to switch and share something else. Sorry. Um, I'm going to show you the program now. Where is it? Oh. I can't find it. Ah, oh, here it is. No, that's the whiteboard. Uh, okay, maybe it did stop. Okay, now let me see. Uh, I'm going to share the desktop number two, maybe, because I can't see it. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, so this is not the un uninteresting example of a, of a uh, Clifford Torres, which is already Lagrangian. Uh, okay, I can put some noise, so it's not more Lagrangian anymore. Uh, maybe less quads to make it more irregular. And then when it's red, it says that, so red gradient means that the symplectic density is quite high. Um, so you can see here this minimal and maximal symplectic density, which is quite high. Let me accelerate this. Uh, it's going to, so it's a flow. It doesn't move a lot, but let's go faster. So when it becomes blue, then completely dark, it, it means that you see the symplectic density is very small. So it's essentially Lagrangian. Let me start the flow once more from zero. Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. We start. So you see it's converging, converging quite quickly. I can put more noise. Okay. So here is our Lagrangian surface in R4. So in fact, it's a, you see a radial projection in S3 and then um, um, stereographic projection in R3. Uh, you can, we can do some other types of things. Oh, okay. There's some, 
another example. Uh, let me put less noise, no noise at all. So this is a, a, a torus in R4, which is, um, to start with, which is not Lagrangian. Um, okay, let's go faster. Okay. So you start from a, a, a trefoil knot in S3. You see it as a knot uh, a circle in R4, and then you choose it a tubular neighborhood. And this is the picture you see, the tubular neighborhood of this knot. So it's not Lagrangian at all, but then you flow it and you see it becomes Lagrangian. So let me restart the flow once more. Okay. Now it's Lagrangian. So it's not really impressive. Maybe they can give you the, the X-ray version of this. Uh, you see? And there, there it's uh, Lagrangian now. OK. So you can fiddle a lot with this program and see many pictures perturbed. I have all sorts of examples. So so it seems do, do you have self-intersections on the way? Uh, it doesn't look like this, no. There is no. Uh, it seems there is no self-intersection in these cases. Sorry, but if you start with a torus, which is smoothly knotted in R4, so, so there is knotting construction, right? So you can make a, mm -hmm. a two-dimensional knot in R4, switch on your flow, and so you say that at the end you get Lagrangian, which is embedded um, so is through, the, through, through embeddings, and this would be very strange. Is the chicken of torus uh, knotted? No, smoothly not. Chicken of the so so I don't know if it is so 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 so, so there is a, indeed a kind of theorem that there are no local no. Okay, but uh, well, I, I don't I, I, I'm not sure it's proved uh, okay. check that uh, two dimensional Lagrangian torus in R4 is smoothly unknotted, but it's highly likely. I mean, we believe that it's like this. It's probably with, proved actually. Okay, with the program, uh, I see only things which have generically no self-intersection, so. No, uh, generically. Uh, in, in the picture, I mean, there is no self-intersection. Yeah, because you see, it's, it, it was at least a while ago kind of really a hot uh, subject, yes, yeah, so of mm. understanding isotopy type of, of uh, Lagrangian surfaces in, in dimension four. So, so I think it would be the first, uh, the first thing to check. Okay. And if you start with a sphere, what uh, what is it? There are no Lagrangian spheres. So. Uh, I didn't. Oh yeah, good idea. Uh, maybe it's going to be contract. I'm not sure. I didn't try I this. Don't know. Okay. No. Uh, the problem is that my program works only for Tor. I I didn't uh, program general surfaces. It's quite it's more. It's easier with a computer program, you know, because you you don't you use a quadrangulation of the torus. So I, I would have to change my program <laughs> to check what your example. What program did you use? Sorry? What program did you use? Oh, it's all made from scratch using a, a programming language, which is called processing. It's, um, it's based on Java. So it's because there is no, there was nothing available for four dimension for surfaces in a four dimensional space. So we had to make everything to program everything. So, so, so do, you, do you have to start from an embedded surface? Is that what you said? No, it's not necessary. In, in fact, you could start from any map, uh, any map from the torus to R4. Uh, but you said something about self-intersection, uh, which I missed. Did you say uh, that what you get in the end has no self-intersection? No, I don't think so. Oh, uh, maybe, maybe there are some examples uh, where you could start with something which is completely flat and then it remains flat. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. We have, for example, which is contained in a complex plane and it's going to be to to be degenerate in the end. Yeah. Uh, okay. Maybe uh, maybe uh, because you can fiddle a lot with this program and uh, it's just give it gives nice picture but uh, no proof or yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, I share the presentation again. Okay, can you see my uh, presentation?
Yes. Um, I'm going, it's full screen now, is it okay? Okay, so uh, the ideas of the proof and the moment map uh, come from uh, Donaldson's paper, moment map and diffeomorphism. For a long time, uh, I thought, well, it's, uh, these ideas are really nice. It would be neat. great if I could use, it, use them somewhere. And here we go. So you start from a, a closed surface uh, with a volume form or a symplectic form in two dimension. And then you consider the moduli space uh, of all maps from your surface to R4, say. You can imagine these maps are embeddings, but they could be anything. And then this space M, M, the moduli space, is endowed with a, an infinite dimensional structure, a Keller structure. So it's a formal thing. It's just to give us an idea. And the definition is uh, essentially trivial. It's flat and quite uninteresting at this stage. So you pick the standard, almost complex structure on R2n identified to Cn. Uh, the Euclidean, Euclidean uh, uh, symplectic form uh, omega. And then if uh, V and W are vector fields along a map, so this means just uh, maps from sigma to R2n, then you define uh, the formally the symplectic, uh, the, the almost complex structure using J and uh, a formal symplectic structure by integrating the, the Euclidean symplectic structure. And, and the same goes for the metric, the Riemannian metric. So this is a tautological flat Keller structure on the space of maps from sigma to R4 or R2n. Now, the interesting thing is uh, the group action. So the group of Hamiltonian transformation of sigma acts on this moduli space by just by precomposition. So every time you have a map from sigma to R4, you can compose it, uh, reparameterize it by a, a Ham Hamiltonian transformation. And it turns out that this Hamiltonian group action is Hamiltonian on the infinite dimensional space. Uh, it, all the structures are invariant, and we have a moment map. The moment map is given, so it's just a computation. It's a map from M to uh, the Lie algebra of the Hamiltonian group. Uh, uh, so this is the space as of a uh, function with integral zero. And we have an explicit formula. So this map is just the symplectic density. So you just pull back the Euclidean uh, symplectic form on R4, and you consider the density. So the, con the quotient of this two form with respect to the volume form on sigma. And now uh, isotropic maps, F, are understood as zeros of this moment map. Okay, so, so I just remind you what moment map means. It's uh, the differential of mu encodes uh, a family of Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian for this vector field ZU. So what is ZU? Uh, every time you have a U seen as a, an element of the Lie algebra, it gives uh, a vector field on sigma, a Hamiltonian vector field on sigma. But then this vector field can be understood as a, an infinitesimal deformation of every map. So it's also a vector field. So xu here is the vector field on sigma. And zu is uh, the analogous of xu, but on the moduli space. So this is essentially the infinitesimal action of ham understood as an action on m. So d mu is a Hamiltonian for this vector field ZU. And now here is the rough idea of the proof of the theorem I mentioned before, the approximation theorem. Very rough idea, I must say. So you start with an isotropic immersion, as in like in the theorem. And of course, this is a zero of this moment map. Now you have to show 
So it's a very classical thing. When you have a zero of a, of a moment map, you can try to look at the deformation theory of the equation, mu equals zero, in the direction of the complexified group action. So uh, all of this is quite dodgy because we, we are in infinite dimension. So you have to think about what's the meaning of this. But uh, you, we can show that the deformation theory uh, in this complexified directions is well behaved. So every time you have a, an infinitesimal deformation given by some Hamiltonian function, uh, then uh, the infinitesimal de deformation of mu is given by the, essentially a Laplacian operator, uh, Laplacian of f. So it's a, a good, it has a, in some sense a good deformation theory. And then the next step is to consider a discretization of the problem. You replace the, the smooth surface, the smooth torus with a discretization. So you have to choose the quadrangulation and uh, uh, you can um, provide coordinates in R4 to each vertex. And then you have a version of the smooth operators in this context, uh, some type of discrete Lap Laplacian operators. So is that what the colors were for in your video? Exactly, exactly. So you have quadrangu quadrangular Qu uh, quadrilaterals in R4, and the colors are the symplectic volumes, well, symplectic uh, densities of these uh, quad uh, quadrilaterals. Okay. Do you have like values for them? Because you didn't. Oh yeah, them. they 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 were showing up in in the in the program. Or maybe you didn't see on the left you know, the maximum and minimum values oh, of I these. I missed it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> And then the last step is to show that in some sense, the discretized problem uh, has an asymptotic behavior, uh, which is somehow related to the smooth case. So there is some type of convergence uh, result, but it's uh, a bit complicated. And then in this context, we have the moment map flow, which is given uh, by the, so it's a, again a classical thing when you're looking for zeros of the moment map in symplectic geometry, you generally consider the downward gradient flow of the norm square of the moment map. So this is what I wrote here. So it's a certain formula. So it's just this downward gradient flow. And then you can imitate, replace the operator which appear here in the right hand side by uh, discrete operators. So just linear operators in finite dimension. And then the program I showed you is just the Euler, Euler method applied to this ODE. Um, but unfortunately, uh, it doesn't, the, the, the flow uh, and the whole picture doesn't transfer very well to the polyhedral case. I mean, and so I wasn't able because of this, I wasn't able to prove, to give a mathematical proof that the flow I showed you always converge. It does, uh, when you, you can see it from the program, but I couldn't uh, study this from a mathematical perspective. So that, that's what I just said. So the Donaldson moment map geometry doesn't fit with the with polyhedral geometry. By this, I mean uh, more precisely, what would be the analog of the group of Hamiltonian transformation of sigma, sigma on a polyhedral surface? Uh, I don't have a precise idea about this. So my dummy idea was, uh, well, why don't we replace this complicated group with something much, sim much, more, much simpler? Um, with the torus, because their Lie algebra looks similar. Well, they don't. That's completely wrong, but that was my idea. So the idea was you have the Hamiltonian of uh, the Hamiltonian group on sigma, and then you have the torus. So in the smooth case, it's an infinite dimensional torus. So you can see this as a product of circles uh, parametrized by the points of the surface. So, 
And then uh, they look similar because uh, they have um, Lie algebras which are related as vector spaces. So the Lie algebra of T is the space of real valued function on sigma. And you have this exponential map just given by the usual exponential. Okay, so, um, so what, what's the next step? There is another relation which is um, given by differentials. So if you have a map from sigma to R4, it has a differential. And you can regard this as a differential as a um, one form on sigma with values in R4. So here we are using the fact that sigma is a torus, a quotient torus. No, I'm not using this, sorry. We, we, because it just has takes value in R4 and R4 is, is flat. So the differential of f is understood as a, a one form with values in R4. And this is going to be our moduli space now, which is going to carry this torus action. Uh, excuse me, uh, I don't understand. So uh, in which sense you replace? So you, you took Lie algebra with non-trivial bracket. Mm, yes. Uh, by a billion kind of algebra. Yeah. I agree, it's a, a stupid idea because the Lie algebra are not no, the no, same. No, no, probably it's not stupid since it, you use it, so, so, but what was the intuition behind it? Um, I, I can't say really, it's uh, by uh, various attempts to, uh, to try to, um, to realize this moment map being, iso being um, isotropic as, uh, I mean, I was trying to find a, a group action uh, for which the moment map is the equation of being isotropic. And then I found out that this uh, torus could be, uh, could, could have this moment map, but uh, I don't have a clear explanation, sorry. It's just, uh, once you find it, um, it's just an observation. Mm -hmm. So okay. let me finish with my observation. Maybe the, the explanation is coming now. So you have this differential of maps. So to a map from the sigma to R4, you associate its differential. So it gives a linear map between moduli spaces. And then you define mu, which is going to, which will turn out to be a moment map as follows. So mu is just, you, you just do like before, but from a formal point of view. So if F was the differential of a map, then uh, that would be uh, the symplectic density of this map. You just compose omega with f, we call it f star of omega, and take the quotient with sigma. And then we have this uh, abstract nonsense. We have this commutative diagram. So we have m with the Hamiltonian action. You have the differential. You have the space of differentials, and you have the torus action on f. Okay, because f is acted on by complex multiplication and we have an obvious action of T. And then we, we have... Um, I'm sorry, are you a mathematician? <laughs> uh, I think so, yeah. Because well, I actually want to be one and I don't understand what you mean by abstract nonsense. So what exactly is wrong in this diagram just so uh, that I understand well, when I look at the subject? Well, it's true. We, we have a map. Uh, the commutative part of the map is here in the center. So as maps, they commute. But I don't know what the relation is between the group actions. They seem to be strangely, uh, they are unrelated. And um, so, and there are no obvious relation between the group either, because uh, as uh, Leonid said, they are, they are, Lie algebra are very different. So um, I can, this holds as a diagram of maps, but I don't have a geometric uh, feeling about this. And why isn't there an arrow from C infinity to T? Uh, Oh, there is, it's just the exponential. So that's the Lie algebra of T. So there is a map, which would be the exponential map. But you don't have an error written there. But because you, that wouldn't be a commutative diagram. <laughs> I did the arrow. 
uh, mu is not an inverse of the exponential map. So is there something wrong with this diagram since you have written the Please, I answered you in person. I, I sent you a link to the notion of abstract nonsense. It's terminology. It's, it's, it's yeah, not, don't, don't it's take it plan. seriously. Means, yeah. uh, I, would, I would like to understand, bet, uh, to have a better understanding of this diagram from a geometric perspective, and I don't. It's just something you just observe that you have this diagram. Okay, thank you. Maybe I just didn't understand then. Okay. So uh, let me talk some more about the moment map geometry of F. So you start from a Keller structure on sigma. So this is an additional piece of information. So we have a complex, almost complex structure metric as, um, compatible with the volume from sigma. You have the Euclidean structures on R4 identified to C2, the Euclidean metric and symplectic form. And then again, they induce some formal Keller structure on the space of differential. So you just compose on the right differential one form with this J on sigma. And then uh, the different, the values, uh, a Euclidean metric G sigma and G, they induce also a metric with the same notation G on differential one forms. And then you can integrate that gives a Riemannian metric on the space F. And we also have a, a Keller form on F just from using the composition with J. And then you do this and you have also, uh, so the, the, the L2 metric G, capital G, induces an orthogonal projection. So the image of D is actually the space of exact differential. So it's a part of the Hodge theory. You can take, uh, consider the orthogonal projection of the differential one form on their exact part, their exact component. MD, the image of D, is identified to M because uh, D is almost injective. It's injective modulo translation of R4. So two maps with the same differential, they agree up to a translation. Okay. So R4 is identified to a, a two-dimensional complex vector space. It provides a multiplication by complex numbers and that defines the action of the torus uh, C infinity, so the, the map from sigma to S1, just by complex multiplication on the values of differential one form values in R4 identified to C2. Okay, so it's a pointwise complex multiplication. And the claim, the observation is that this action of T on F is a Hamiltonian and mu the, is a moment map. Okay. So we, we really, like in the picture before, we really have an action of T on F and mu is the moment map. We have an action of ham on M and mu D is the moment map and somehow they commute with D, okay? So now what would, would we, we would like to um, do to introduce a moment map flow. So, um, we have this functional, which is the L2, L2 norm of the moment map. So it's a traditional thing to do this in a symplectic uh, moment map geometry. And then we consider the downward gradient flow of phi, which is expected to converge to, um, towards uh, zeros of the moment map. But the problem with this flow is that it's not going to preserve the image of D, which corresponds to maps, right? differential of maps, modulo translation. Why? Because uh, the image of D turns out to be not invariant under the group action and also the flow, there's no reason why it should preserve MD. So it doesn't actually. So never mind. We, we consider a projection of the flow on MD or if you, or if you prefer, we just restrict to MD phi defines a functional on MD, and we look at the downward gradient flow uh, along this uh, subspace. So you can state it like this. So that's the usual gradient flow in F, and then you look at the, the orthogonal projection pi of this flow on MD. And this flow 
turns out to be really well behaved. Um, so this flow in the smooth setting uh, has a short time existence. You can deduce this from um, the Cauchy-Lipschitz theorem. Uh, it's very easy. It's because uh, essentially this uh, gradient phi of f is um, a polynomial expression in the coordinates of f. And pi, the projection from uh, Hodge theory, is a Lipschitz, a Lipschitz map. It's a continuous linear map. And then you can, using this, you can apply uh, Cauchy-Lipschitz theorem and uh, show that there is short time existence for the flow in some older spaces. And then the fixed point of this flow restricted to MD, they are exactly the, the fixed points, the, the, the zeros of the, mom, the, the moment map, so isotropic maps. The other good thing about this flow is that the L2 norm along the flow must decrease. It can only decrease along the flow. Okay, so that's uh, all I can prove in infinite dimension. But then you can adapt everything I said in the polyhedral setting where sigma is a surface that comes with a tri triangulation. Let's call it a polyhedron or I don't know, if maybe it's not the right terminology. And then we have polyhedral analogs of maps from sigma to alpha and differentials. So very quickly, let's say that uh, a function on the polyhedron is uh, now for valued maps on the set of vertices of the tri triangulation. It's called actually in uh, computer imaging, it's called a triangular mesh. Or you could regard this mesh as a, an affine map on each simplex of the polyhedron of the simplicial complex. And I call these maps uh, polyhedral maps. And then F understood as an affine map, map on each uh, facet uh, admits uh, a differential along each facet. It's a constant differential. It's a constant differential uh, on the interior of each facet. Uh, and then an element of the torus is a circle value map on the set of facets. So just to mention that all the moment map geometry construction, they have obvious analogs in this polyhedral setting. And there is an analog for the flow. Um, but for which we have much stronger results. So the flow, the finite dimensional version of the flow is a, an ordinary differential equation. And solutions uh, exist for, for all times up to infinity. They converge towards zeros of the moment map in MD, which are um, identified to polyhedral maps, uh, which are isotropic. Um, so that's another version of the flow. It's not the version of the flow I showed you with the computer. Uh, the co computer one is uh, the dodgy version I had in the first place. This is the new version. And uh, that allows you to prove things like um, this finite dimensional flow gives you a retraction of the space of polyhedral isotropic maps. Uh, actually, the, so the total space of map retracts on the zero set of the moment map. So you can realize polyhedral isotropic map as a retraction of the total space of maps. And uh, a computer version of this program is um, being written right now, but it's not finished yet. Okay, so how much time do I have? Uh, 10 minutes or? I think you almost, you have 20 minutes, I think. Okay, good. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's the first part, uh, the first moment map construction. So at this stage, um, it will give us a new flow, but we can prove that it's convergent so we can uh, make explicit, semi-explicit construct, construction with them. And this flow and this moment map pictures uh, is very similar to another one, which applies to symplectomorphisms. Um, so here we, now we consider a four torus, uh, 
which is obtained as a quotient. So here H is the space of quaternions and gamma is a lattice. So we consider this torus and it has uh, many complex structures, but let's say we fix a, a special one. So the one given by complex multiplication on the right in H and we see H as a complex vector space with this complex multiplication on the right. Then it has also- I'm sorry, a... where does it say or, or not say? The, the video that you showed, why are you defining it on a torus? Why is there a specified space for it? S sorry. I mean, I... Not a torus, a lattice. You have the quotient of a torus. Why is it the quotient by a lattice at the end? Um, well, if you want a computer version, you're going to real realize your two torus like this. You start with a quotient of R2 by a, a lattice and it's a torus. And then you, you can choose sub lattice, which, which is going to define a quadrangulation. So it's a practical way to, to define a quadrangulation than a triangulation. But there is no reason why you should, we don't have to pick this. It's not necessary. So lattice is not a requirement. You could have done- No, it's, it's a data. I'm, I'm starting from this data. Okay, so, so now my torus is automatically endowed with a particular flat metric and some special complex structures, actually a hyperkeller structure. So this is just my, my data. Um, but if, so I have this flat Keller structure, but then I can forget, I can forget about the complex structure and I just obtain uh, a symplectic torus M omega M. And this is what I'm interested in and the symplectic group uh, of this uh, torus. Okay, so this torus, it admits, uh, so it has a, a group of symplectic transformations, smooth, the smooth ones. And in this group sits uh, the group of linear transformation, which is denoted here GL of M omega M. So it's just the linear group of H which leaves um, gamma invariant and preserves uh, the symplectic form on the cover, okay? So it's a discrete subgroup of sim the symplectic group. And I, I think it's a conjecture, maybe I'm mistaken, you just correct me. It's a conjecture uh, that the above inclusion is a homotopy equivalence. Is it true? I think so, because I, I, I asked the question to many people and they, they said, we, we don't know much about a uh, group of symplect symplectomorphisms. Well, there are some results, but uh, this particular result is not known. So it's true, it holds for, for two torus, but no, we don't know anything about the four torus. Am I right? <laughs> okay, so it's an open question. Yeah. And that was a really nice question that was um, or a, a remark made by uh, Vincent Humilier at last uh, Symplectics seminar in Paris. He told me, why don't, something along the line, why don't you try to prove it using a modified moment map flow technique? Okay. So I thought about it and then I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. Um, so in this context, we have a space, a moduli space M. Now M is the space of map from M to itself. So in all the rest, uh, capital M is uh, this quotient torus, okay? So the map of the torus to itself, smooth maps. And again, I'm going faster now, differential of these maps can be understood as one form on M with values in H. Which, which is the tangent space to M. It's uh, the uh, tangent uh, bundle is trivial. So we are using this. And then we say that the differential of a map belongs to the space F of one forms with values in H, okay? We also have a, a complex multiplication, as I said, on the right of H. And this induces a pointwise action of this infinitesimal dimensional torus on the space of differential one forms. Then in fact, we have a hyperkeller geometry now yeah, and a hyperkeller moment map geometry. Now you have the complex multiplication by i, j and k on the left. 
not on the right, on the left. And they induce uh, almost complex structures denoted I, capital I, capital J, and capital K on M. This is uh, part of the hyperkeller structure. Uh, the corresponding Keller forms, they are denoted omega i, j, and k in the same way. So Keller forms on the torus on M. And again, there is a formal construction uh, of a hyperkeller structure on the space F of differential one forms. So the, there are three almost complex structures which are given by composing one forms on the right with these three uh, almost complex structure on the torus i, j, and k. So you see, it's a tautological constructions. And uh, the, the L2 metric G is a formal metric obtained by integrating the Euclidean metric on the torus, uh, exactly like in the construction I gave before. So it's completely similar. Uh, the curly omega i, j, and k are associated to these complex structure j, i, j, and k on capital F on the space of differential one forms. So anyway, so I'm accelerating the <laughs> pace now. So it turns out that this action on the space of differential forms F, this torus action, preserves all this hyperkeller structure. Uh, so the complex structures, the formal Keller forms. And furthermore, uh, it is a uh, triply Hamiltonian with respect to each uh, symplectic form. So here I put uh, omega curly bullet, where bullet stands for the three versions, the three symplectic form, the, the three um, complex structures. And we can calculate these moment maps explicitly, okay, they are given by this formula. So here F is my one form with values in H and you can use it to pull back the, you can pull back the, the uh, Keller forms on H, the Keller form on H. Omega, oh, sorry, um, I should have written, oh yeah, that's correct. So omega I, omega J and omega T, K are the three uh, Keller forms which appear here on the torus. So you have this wedge. So it's some type of, it looks similar to, to the um, uh, symplectic density we had before, but there is no symplectic density in four, dimension four. So that's, this is the replacement for symplectic density. Instead of one equation, we have three, in, three equations. So a remark, the Keller forms associated to IJK, they, they are compatible with the reversed orientation of the torus, and they actually span the space of anti-self-dual forms on the torus. So it turns out, you can see, because they are anti-self-dual, uh, the vanishing of the moment maps mu bullet, they imply that, in fact, you can see, you can understand this uh, as a Euclidean inner, inner product because it's anti-self-dual. And uh, the vanishing of this moment map imply that the anti-self-dual part of this two form vanishes. So the vanishing of the moment maps uh, imply that this is a, a self-dual form. And if you, on the top of that, uh, F is a differential, an exact differential uh, given by a function, and this function preserves, uh, preserves uh, the, simplic, the cohomology class of the symplectic structure, then F has to be a symplectic, symplectomorphism. So if we have an, uh, an exact differential, which satisfies a cohomology condition and the vanishing of the moment map, then this is a symplectomorphism. So, it allows you, us to understand symplectomorphism as uh, the zeros of a moment map. So it's uh, exactly similar to the construction I did before. And then you can try to introduce a moment map flow in the same way, except that now it's a hyperkeller moment map flow and it has to be modified to preserve the image of D. So now the functional is given by the 
the L2 norm square of the hyperkeller moment map. And then you look at the downward gradient flow of this functional along F, the space of differential one forms. It doesn't preserve MD, but you can project it on MD again. And all the construction I gave you and the proof I gave you before in the case of uh, surfaces, they go through. Um, especially, so I skip directly to some sort of polyhedral setting. Okay, so now you have to consider polyhedral maps, or p you could say piecewise linear maps from the torus to itself, right, except that they are adapted to some triangulation. So I call this polyhedral maps. So the polyhedral version of the modified moment map flow has long time existence and it's convergent. The limits are symplectic maps of the four torus, polyhedral symplectic maps. And then you can realize, as before, the space of polyhedral symplectic maps as a deformation retract of the space of all possible polyhedral maps. So we have this um, nice result for polyhedral maps and polyhedral symplectic maps. And then, I mean, the process of proving this, but um, so next, I would like to have a computer version of the flow, of course, except that it's going to be more, more involved with the uh, computing, uh, computing uh, power because we have the curse of the dimension. So if you take a subdivision of the four torus, if you subdivide each, each uh, meridian by say uh, 100, the number of, uh, of cells of the quadrangulation is going to be 100 to the power of four, which is bad. And also from a perspective of uh, programming, uh, when you have a, a quadrangulation of the four torus, then you have four cubes and uh, finding their triangulation is uh, some, is quite involved because uh, if you want to find a triangulation of a four cubes, it has already quite a lot of uh, simplexes. And in the end, we would like to, to be able to visualize uh, polyhedral deformations of uh, the Lagrangian and symplectic vibration of the four torus. But then I thought some more about uh, Vincent Humilier's suggestion. And uh, I think I can prove the following results. So it's a theorem, but say in progress, the proof is not completely written yet. So I can't prove what uh, Vincent was uh, asking. But I, can... I apologize, just a very quick, once again, I'm not a mathematician. I thought mm -hmm. theorem is after it's already been proven. Can you have a theorem before you proved it? Oh, uh, the, I'm confident I'm going to be uh, able to prove this theorem in the very near future. <laughs> So you're but, calling it a theorem preemptively, but that's not usually what mathematicians Oh, it's, it's, maybe it's bad. So I, I should say conjecture likely to be true. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm just replacing in the previous conjecture uh, the space of symplectomorphism of M with the space of piecewise linear symplectic maps of M. Okay, and if, if I do this, so piecewise symplectic map, uh, what I call polyhedral maps, except that polyhedral maps uh, have a fixed uh, triangulation in the background. So if you have a homotopy of piecewise linear symplectic maps, their, their adapted triangulation may jump. They may be really different. So there is some te technical work involved here, but Essentially, modulo homotopy, you can fix this uh, triangulation in the background and assume that all your maps are uh, to homotopy, all your maps are uh, affine on each um, uh, facet of the triangulation. Okay, so, so you have this, this inclusion, uh, the standard inclusion of the linear symplectic transformation in the piecewise linear ones. Um, then modulo this little problem of uh, fixing the background 
triangulation, you can rely on this theorem H, which says that you can retract them by deformation on, um, on uh, symplectic isomorphism, piecewise linear symplectic isomorphism. And then you can, you guess, maybe, you can see that you can use these techniques to show that this inclusion is a homotopy equivalence, okay? Using the flow I introduced before. All right. Um, there is another thing which is not clear. Um, in fact, it's not, well, it's an exercise, but rather it's not completely obvious. It's not completely straightforward. Uh, you know that if you have a smooth piecewise, uh, if you have a smooth symplectic map for, um, of a closed symplectic manifolds, it only uh, needs to respect the symplectic form. And then this implies that this is a diffeomorphism. Okay. There is an analogous statement for piecewise linear symplectic maps, but the proof is much more complicated. So you just start with a symplectic map, which preserves, which preserves the symplectic structure almost everywhere in the sense we said before. And then this map of the torus has to be a uh, homeomorphism. It's not obvious at all. Okay. And that's uh, what I wanted to tell you for today. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Are there any questions? I have a question. So, the, uh, so I remember when Graz approved his results. So. So he has a triangulation on the domain and the triangulation, then the image of this, uh, of course, ch changes uh, oh. when he does the, the homotopy. So then there were also questions. He looked, so when you have two different triangulations and have a piecewise linear map to the other, they are generically, uh, there is no, uh, they are stable. I mean, they, you can't even move this maps if you keep the two triangulations fixed. Oh. Uh, so there were, all kinds of things. But so I wonder, so, so his, his basic idea was, if you take a, a symplectic map, say from R to N into R to N, you take the graph and then you approximate um, the, so, so, the, so you approximate the graph by a piece. Moment. So there's a generating function. I think whose gradient, is, so if you're sufficiently close to the identity, let's say, you take a generating function and then you approximate that generating function by a piecewise uh, C1, C1, this bounded uh, derivative generating function, hmm. piecewise quadratic. And hmm. then you linearize that thing and then, uh, then you, you get sort of this uh, symplectic map. So that was sort of his idea. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, everything was boiling down to two approximation results about functions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that you can approximate sort of a, a smooth function by a piecewise uh, quadratic, which is C1 with control derivatives. Mm -hmm. So it's close to C2. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a nice idea. But OK, if you for local construction, this is fine. But even if you if you start with a given um, polyhedral Lagrangian torus in R four, um, you could think that the deformation are going to be uh, given by such uh, piecewise linear functions. But uh, we we don't have a tubular neighborhood. Uh, no, there's yeah yeah. It's, uh, I think the techniques uh, yeah. So one shouldn't really look from the usual techniques. I think. Uh, there's a different set of techniques possible. unknown to mankind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So something right. like that. Yeah. But I, I, I should sorry. also say that uh, a student of mine is actually looking. So there is the, the first theorem I mentioned uh, about approximation of smooth uh, Lagrangian uh, Lagrange tori by uh, polyhedral ones. 
a student of mine is uh, trying to find a new proof by um, elementary techniques, which don't you, it seems to work. It's finishing now. Um, so it's just basic um, construction, uh, some trying to, so you have quadrilaterals, you add points at all, uh, for all edges and you, you move these points a little bit. And doing this, you can uh, move the symplectic, uh, the symplectic volume from one cell to another. And there is a way to do this to, <laughs> well, so, sorry, I missed. What, what does he prove in an elementary way? Uh, he, prove, he, he gives another proof of the theorem I gave there, ah, an alternate okay. proof of this okay. theorem, which is elementary. Yeah. Yeah, so so okay. I, I think now I remember because it was in 1997 when God saw this. Or yeah. So if you have a triangulation in R to N and look at it piecewise, so fix the triangulation and that's your domain. Yeah? And you, 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 take a, you take a piecewise linear symplectic map on this triangulation. Then you can ask about how can you deform, so forget about the target, how can you deform this by piecewise linear with respect to this domain? And generically, the only thing is, was that you could use some global composite with global linear maps. So there was not a lot of rigidity you could mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. Because the things, because if 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 the domain triangulation was too generic, that made it completely rigid. So that you take this map, and then of course you can compose it with linear maps on mm -hmm. top. But but there was no, no, there was nothing you could do in general with something which was not linear. So so the so the model lie of this six was very constrained generically, and then he came up with this. Uh, amazing triangulations which he picks and then you have a lot of rigidity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and these things have had a lot to do like with <laughs> i think uh, ultimately with the fact that if you have a triangle that you preserve the area if the if the top thing moves mm -hmm. on a parallel to the bottom so, so there, was a, there was a lot of uh, amazing geometry in what he came up with. And then he was so exhausted from these results that he quit mathematics. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. uh, could you please uh, return to this, uh, the main equation? So dfdt equals to uh, yes. gradient. Uh, so. Oh, sorry. Uh, where is it? So guys, I have unfortunately to leave a meeting. Bye, it was a wonderful talk. Thanks, bye. Thank you. So bye. this equation? Yes. Well, you repeat it next as a gradient of the moment map. So which kind of operator is this? So in the right-hand side. Uh, let's see. Here. Yeah, exactly. Okay, right. so, uh, okay, so uh, this is a functional, so it's a function on F this uh, infinite dimensional space yes. and it, it's a flat euclidean space with this l2 uh, inner product okay. Yes. okay no i think i understand definition so my question okay. is the following so when you calculate yeah so it's the... you get some operator on f's oh. so 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 we, what what is this is differential operator or Ah, uh, you would like to see the formula? Yes, I would like to, to see the formula for the right hand side. Okay, I can give you the formula. Maybe I'm going to show you another paper. Um, okay. Let's see this. Okay. Uh, so I have some formula. Um, let's see. Mm. No, why did I write this? Um, oh, here we are. So for example, here. So I don't, don't know if it's really informative. Uh, this uh, curly R is some uh, linear operator, fiber was linear operator acting on F. 
So it's a, a conjugation by complex structure acting on the left and on the right. So you can multiply f by i because it takes value with, in a complex vector space, C2. And uh, you can compose by j, the almost complex structure on the of the surface on the right. So this is what R does. It's a, an involution. OK? And here, this is mu of f. But mu of f is essentially given by Rf uh, mu of f. It's uh, also the inner product. Let's see. Uh, oh, can I see the formula? Sorry, I should maybe I should write it down. Um, and, uh, and just in, in general terms, is it differential operator? No, it's not a differential operator. It's a zero order term operator. Zero order. It has well, yeah. It's very strange. I agree. I was surprised. It has degree zero, and pi. It's a uh, the edge projection. So it's also it's non-local, but it's also a zero order uh, pseudo differential operator. So the right hand side is a zero order pseudo differential operator. Uh, and this is very strange, but. <laughs> It's it's uh, it satisfies the the assumption of the Cauchy Lipschitz theorem, so it's good for short time existence. But you cannot uh, try to extend these results using some type of uh, elliptic regularity or like parabolic equation. These equations are not parabolic at all. Is it contracting in some sense? Um, uh, yes, so. yes, it is because uh, the moment map is. Um, is a, it's a polynomial map in F. It's a quadratic map. Uh, so this, when you compute this gradient, so phi is of order four because it's the square of a polynomial of order two. And when you take the gradients, it's some polynomial operator in F of order three. So it's contracting, uh, well, it's, it's locally Lipschitz in, near uh, zero mm -hmm. or locally it's it's a it's a polynomial thank you but then if you want long time existence there's no way i could get this in um, the smooth setting this is why i'm turning to the polyhedral finite dimensional world and then you can get very strong result because as you see the in fact the you see this theorem here this formula there is actually a, a formula for the variation of the, the L2 norm along the flow. It can only decrease because it's, in fact, there is a, this explicit formula. It's minus, essentially minus the L2 norm of the moment map. Any other Possibly. question? Okay. okay, so let's thank Jan again. Thank you.